Welcome everyone, my name is Graham Calder from P3 Permaculture and today I'll be presenting to you the preliminary design for the Legacy Park project in the Chester Basin area of Nova Scotia, Canada. So now we'll begin presentation of the Legacy Park preliminary design for the Chester Basin area of Nova Scotia, Canada. The Legacy Park site is an old homestead site um, that has been turned over um, for the creation of a park. The vision of the Legacy Park is to honor the historical activities of the region and to demonstrate the um, industrial impact and other impacts that the region has had and the resources in this region have had as well on the people. So we want to create an interactive, evolving park experience with an ed edible, integrated landscape. We would like to integrate local expertise into the park and have events and workshops that focus on these expertise as well. The walk through the site will be surrounded by edible plants that are of the area of Nova Scotia, um, naturalized or native to this area and they will provide an edible experience as you wander through the educational experience of Legacy Park. And the main goal of this park is to create it in a way that is self-generating. So this means that the park itself will be able to produce a lot of the needs that it requires to expand and grow. So this will be very much like a natural growing ecosystem. It will start small and grow as it can and as it needs into the full design that we are about to present to you. So this is what the design would look like in phase three, which would be the five to ten year span, the completed phase of the Legacy Park design. And as you can see, there are many, many features that have been added. Um, as was stated previously, however, this is a gradual process and elements will grow and become uh, as important as they are able to be um, at the particular time when they are put in place. So we're going to start this tour with the five major themes and we'll begin with the industrial site. So the industrial site um, is specifically an area that will concentrate on the gold mining, barrel making, and Christmas tree harvesting of Nova Scotia. The next area will be the homestead site and this is where the existing home would have been on this piece of property. And so we'll be honoring the tradition of preserving crops using cold cell, uh, root cellars, as well as looking at uh, different alternative types of growing food um, and techniques that were used by our homesteading past. The third area is the Mi'kmaq area, and this is to focus on some of the wild foods and medicines um, that helped us get through our early stages of uh, living here on the land with the Mi'kmaq people. And so this area will honor those traditions and those foods and medicines. And our fourth area is the community area. This is an area that consists of a small gazebo gathering area um, and an area for people to, to gather and to have small events and uh, fundraising events as well. And the final area, which is more of a area for um, specifically protection of habitat on this site is a wildlife corridor that borders the brook that flows through the property. Now this will be to ensure that there is enough habitat for wildlife in this uh, park that we do not have to um, we do not have to conflict with their existence on this park by creating Legacy Park as we envision it. So this corridor will help for the movement of species through the site as well as providing habitat and food sources for threatened species of birds um, and other animals and plants of Nova Scotia. The industrial zone in detail. So as you can see in this zone we have um, three major areas. We have the gold area, we have the copper or the cooper area which is where the barrel making activities would have been going on and the Christmas tree area. So these three main industrial zones will be the focus of this area. So in this 
industrial zone, we'll look here now at the barrel workshop. So in the third and final phase, uh, the goal would be to have a demonstration barrel making site where we have some several semi-completed barrels um, and some of the tools and trees and plants that would be used in the process of barrel making. So looking at the barrel woodlot management, what types of, of trees would be used, um, and having a demonstration of the processes used to build uh, barrels, casks, and other such uh, such craftsmanships. The gold quarry is going to be bordering that right on the other side of the path and so in this area we'll be demonstrating the old um, tools and other machines and, and potential um, an example of the a gold quarry site in order to give people an idea of how gold was extracted um, in older times. In the cooper shop, really the idea is to give people an idea of the amount of labor and craftsmanship that goes into a, an elegant made barrel. Also to understand that barrel makers didn't only make barrels, they just happened to be one of their biggest products. So we're demonstrating that all the other elements that were used and, and produced by a cooper. In the gold quarry, the, the goal would be to demonstrate the process and the difficulty and the amount of work required to be able to extract gold from uh, an area. So a demonstration quarry site would be an ideal eventual goal for this, um, and a, a closed off example mine shaft, not an actual shaft, but just so that you can get the feel of the experience of an actual gold quarry. Now, a secondary part of this gold quarry would be a small panning site, so an area where children and parents can go and you know, try their hand at gold panning. So this would be a little hands-on display area where children can actually pan for gold in a little setup where maybe we can have hidden gold nuggets or whatnot to uh, get the kids excited. So these are some of the tools that would have been familiar to a panning site. So this would be something that would be um, demonstrated on the information panels until the site was established. And the third component to the industrial zone is the Christmas tree area. So in this area, we would like to demonstrate traditional tree varieties, um, have a demonstrations on the planting and maintenance and shearing of the trees, and have ex uh, information on the first exporters of Christmas trees um, in Nova Scotia and their, um, their techniques and, and, uh, and trials and tribulations. So we'd also like to look at alternative trees and planting techniques because Christmas tree planting is growing, but it's also growing in various directions and there's lots of potential for interplanting and polycropping using um, blueberries and other common local plants to grow in between the blueberries and the Christmas trees. So here's a demonstration just showing some of the different varieties and what a standard um, Christmas tree plantation would look like. Now for the homestead zone, we're going to be focusing on a lot of the traditional foods of a homestead. So we'll look at a heritage forest garden that still remains on this site. Um, everything in gray here is in existence already, and so uh, we've got uh, apple varieties, we've got grapes, we've got black currants, uh, and many other little small fruits within this site. So these will be propagated and, and grown and sold as a partial income for this site. And we'll also demonstrate alternative techniques for pollinization using uh, solitary bees or mason bees, as well as um, reducing pest control or reducing problematic pests with bat boxes and bird houses. Some of these fruits would be as common as the apple and grape and also as foreign and useful as the elderberry or the mulberry, which are both very common to this area anciently. And as you can see on the bottom of this photo, there is an example of a food forest, which would be very, very common in a uh, homesteading site as well as a traditional Native American foraging site. So in the homestead zone, we'll also be demonstrating root cellaring, which is a technique to preserve root vegetables over the winter, look at alternative composting techniques, cold frames for extending the growing season, companion gardens for natural fertility and natural pest control, and square foot gardening for maximizing the productive planting in a small area. 
So all of these techniques are very common to the homesteading way, but most of them are quite lost to us today. And so the idea would be to revitalize that information and embrace its application in today's life in order to look at small-scale production of food, in order to increase our food security, and give people a little bit of a touch back to one of the staples and mainstays of livelihood um, in, our, uh, in our more historical past. The Mi'kmaq zone, this is a zone that is adjacent to the homesteading zone. And in this zone, we would like to focus on specifically three different areas. So the traditional craft area would be in order to demonstrate basket making and the plants that would be used for basket making, such as the black ash um, and willow and other plants, like uh, other trees like that. We'll be looking at quill work and some of the demonstrations of quill work, leather work, and the wigwams and housing structures that they would have lived in while producing a lot of these crafts for trade and everyday use. Some of the specific medicines would also be demonstrated in this area, and so we would look at not only the crafts that were traded with the first settlers of this area, but also a lot of the wild foods and medicines that were um, used by the first settlers and the traditional First Nations of this area. So really looking at some of their techniques for traditional cultivation, some of the wild foods like wild carrot and wild potato that were used, as well as the wild medicine. These are just a small example of some of the fruits and vegetables and berries and nuts that were available in a traditional wild food forest of the Mi'kmaq culture. We can also look at some of the medicine and some of the um, shallow sea catch. So that would be eels, lobsters, clams, um, mussels, and oysters. In the third area of the Mi'kmaq zone, we'll have the birch and maple area where we focus specifically on um, the use of paper birch for the production of canoes and the use of maple for production of sugar. Another demonstration in this area would be what um, trees were used for making snowshoeing and other such uh, wooden crafts. This process is something that is very, very unknown to us today and so we would like to have a demonstration of a half-completed canoe to look at some of the examples of how this process would have been done. Now again, this is in the third phase, in the completed phase of the project. So in the meantime, most of these sites would actually just be on a photographic display um, with several workshops to build up their existence until they are completed and in place as a functioning demonstration site. The community zone is very important because it provides seating area, it provides an area to eat, it provides a small shelter area for children, as well as a kiosk where plants and fruits and other items that are produced in this fully functioning park, um, when it is fully functioning, can be sold. And so this is the main kind of gathering area at the entrance of the park. In this area, the benches will be made from mostly local materials, specifically um, materials that have had low processing, so half-sawn log benches, half-sawn log tables, and even living willow structures so that the maintenance of the site is very much reduced. So the shelter provided for the benches, um, the shade provided for the benches is a shade that grows and it propagates and will actually provide cuttings from the willow that can be sold and used in other workshops down the line. So again, the picnic tables would be using that rustic approach of either whole log or half sawn log um, style of production. So really looking at a, a more traditional technique for building um, seating and, uh, and eating places. The children's zone is actually going to be a living willow structure. And this structure is a very traditional and, and popular technique that is big in, in London and in most of the UK. It is something that is growing very quickly in Canada, however the supply of willow is still quite limited. So this site would not only provide a beautiful living structure that requires little to no maintenance, and it will also provide a resource for the production of other willow structures and other workshops as well. So this is not only going to be a living children's playhouse, but it will also provide willow shoots for the expansion of the Living Willow projects. 
These projects will consist of a main archway as the entrance into the park, as well as a living willow fence around the park so as to reduce the noise from traffic and give a more sense of, uh, of an enclosed living area within this park. So these living fences would also be very low maintenance and would provide materials for their own expansion and repair. The wildlife corridor is a final zone um, that has been uh, determined as uh, very necessary for this site. Because there is an existing wildlife corridor, it is very important to connect that through so that the animals and the birds can move through this site very elegantly. It's important to have the ability for wildlife to move through a park, otherwise they end up um, reducing their presence and, and actually you know, not being able to survive or thrive in this area. So the idea would not just be to have a connecting area, but also to have homes and, and food for the birds, the butterflies, the bees, and other animals that would live in a natural habitat like this. Another important factor would be to specifically replant any of the threatened or endangered species of Nova Scotia, as well as um, animals and, and birds, and try and create the habitat and food for them to thrive and survive in this area. The park will be established in phases, and it's essential to start with small phases, especially when dealing with a large project like this Legacy Park. So the phase one is much, much different than what the phase three would look like. And so in this phase, we really only have the main path established without wooden planks, but just with wood chips, and some of the key areas and key plants that are planted in place so as to provide resources and to grow so that in phase two we can start to realize some of these bigger demonstration projects. So phase one really looks at establishing the, the primary pathway, putting the boulders of quartz and gold in place, um, having the Christmas trees planted so they can begin to grow through their cycle, and having the barrel trees and the willows and the black locusts planted as well. The main signs will be in place for all demonstration areas so as to provide information on all of the eventual sites that will be established. So showing images of the gold quarry, images of a gold panning site, of the homesteading site, and all of these elements that people can participate in their growth through workshops as well as um, anticipate and uh, look forward to the expansion of these elements. So in the industrial site, we have the main pathway that's established, the gold, gold and quartz boulders in place, and the Christmas trees planted. The barrel trees are the trees that would be used in the making of the barrel, so the specific species that would be used for that, as well as establishing those main signs again for um, information on these, uh, these exhibit areas. The homestead site, there would be very little that is to be done except for propagating the existing plants and actually selling some of these plants for some income. Uh, establishing a small bridge to be able to cross the brook and again continuing the main path. The willows and black locusts will be planted because they're a longer term plant. Um, and we would establish the garden spiral around the main sign in order to prevent erosion and to give some life to that, um, that iconic image that represents what Legacy Park will become. Some of the income sources for this, as, as I mentioned, the sale of some of the plants as they're propagated, as well as the tree planting workshop. So as these trees, such as black locust and willow, are, are being planted, um, we can have a, a workshop that helps to fund their purchase and their establishment. Also, the garden spiral workshop is something that can be done at a very small scale for homes and is a very popular workshop as well that can also be done to help provide income for the site development. In the Mi'kmaq site, the preliminary pathway would continue through and connect to a point on the, on the property where it would allow through flow traffic to move through the site from the Legion onto the other parks that are just down the road. Um, the wild blueberries would be established, the paper birch and the elderberries would be established as well. And these plants would be propagated so that um, if there is a surplus they can be sold and so they can be spread around the site as well. Again here we can have tree planting workshops and we can have wild food and medicine workshops looking at the wild foods that are already on site and 
still gaining a um, bit of momentum and a bit of economic um, benefit from this site while we build on the future exhibits. The community site will again have the preliminary pathway um, and be begin planting the willows for the living fence, the living archway, and the living children's dome. So this allows us to have workshops on living fences, living children's domes, and living archways. So these are all very beneficial for the funding of the development of this site. We'll also like to include some seating areas, so whether they are picnic tables or benches, um, um, that is to be decided, but just some seating areas so that there is uh, a bit of a gathering space in the first phase of this design. So in conclusion, Legacy Park will begin as a simple design and evolve with time to become a flourishing interactive heritage site. It will embrace the land, the resources, and the people of the Chester Basin both of the past and the present, and it will provide income and a gathering site for many, many people. I think it's very important to, in, to emphasize that a lot of the elements on, in this site are specifically tapping into local resources. A lot of the workshops are um, workshops that are given, such as the um, butter making at Ross Farms, and the barrel making at Ross Farms, as well as uh, living willow structures and native Mi'kmaq medicine by many, many different local people. So the main focus would be to integrate local knowledge into this design to, prov to provide a hub for this historical educational exchange. So if there are any questions on this design, please feel free to contact me at info at p3permaculture.ca. And if you're interested in permaculture and other natural design um, examples and projects, please visit our website at www.p3permaculture.ca. Before we make any decisions on this project, I think it's important to highlight the fact that this is only a preliminary design, a brainstorming, if you will, of all the potential that I've seen within this site. And so it's important to understand that certain elements will have more priority than others, the sequence of when they'll be established will change, and elements such as um, um, outhouses or dry composting toilets will be necessary throughout the development of this site. It's also crucial to take into consideration the wheelchair accessibility of this site and the safety features that would need to be in place for this to be a proper um, running municipal park of Chester Basin area. So if there are any further questions or any comments on the design, please don't hesitate to contact us at info at p3permaculture.ca. And if you'd like to know more about permaculture and natural designed ecosystems and homes, please contact us or visit our website at www.p3permaculture.ca. Thank you very much and have a great day.